One of the hallmarks of the 21st century is that we are all having more and more interactions with machines and fewer with human beings. If you've lost your white-collar job to downsizing or to a worker in India or China, you're most likely a victim of what economists have called technological unemployment. There's a lot of it going around with more to come. At the vanguard of this new wave of automation is the field of robotics. Everyone has a different idea of what a robot is and what they look like, but the broad universal definition is a machine that can perform the job of a human. They could be mobile or stationary, hardware or software, and they are marching out of the realm of science fiction and into the mainstream. The story will continue in a moment. The age of robots has been anticipated since the beginning of the last century. Fritz Lang fantasized about it in his 1927 film Metropolis. In the 1940s and 50s, robots were often portrayed as household help. May I take your hat and coat? And by the time the Star Wars trilogy arrived, robots with their computerized brains and nerve systems had been fully integrated into our imagination. Now they're finally here. But instead of serving us, we find them competing for our jobs. And according to MIT professors Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, one of the reasons for the jobless recovery. Our economy is bigger than it was before the start of the Great Recession. Corporate profits are back. Uh, business investment in hardware and software is back higher than it's ever been. What's not back is the jobs. And you think technology and increased automation is a factor in that? Absolutely. The percentage of Americans with jobs is at a 20-year low. Just a few years ago, if you traveled by air, you would have interacted with a human ticket agent. Today, those jobs are being replaced by robotic kiosks. Bank tellers have given way to ATMs. Sales clerks are surrendering to e-commerce. I'm an automated system that can... And switchboard operators and secretaries to voice recognition technology. There are lots of examples of r routine, middle-skilled jobs that involve relatively structured tasks, and those are the jobs that are being eliminated the fastest. Those kinds of jobs are easier for our friends in the artificial intelligence community to design robots to handle them. They could be software robots, they could be physical robots. What is there out there that people would be surprised to learn about? In the robotics area, let's sure. say. There are heavily automated warehouses where there are either very few or no people around. That absolutely took me by surprise. It's on display at this huge distribution center in Devons, Massachusetts, where roughly 100 employees work alongside 69 robots that do all the heavy lifting and navigate a warehouse maze the size of two football fields. Moving 10,000 pieces of merchandise a day from storage shelf to shipping point faster and more efficiently than human workers ever could. We think it's part of the new American economy. Bruce Welty is CEO of Quiet Logistics, which fills orders and ships merchandise for retailers in the apparel industry. This entire operation was designed around the small orange robots made by a company outside Boston called Kiva and can now be found in warehouses all over the country. Now this is the order that she's filling, right? On this screen? Yes. In a typical warehouse, she'd have to walk from location to location with a number of totes. And that's the innovation here is that the product comes to her. And all of this is pre-programmed? Nobody has to sit there and tell these robots where to go? No, no, it's all done with algorithms. It's a lot of uh, mathematics, a lot of science that went into this. Customer orders are transmitted from a computer to Wi-Fi antennas that direct the robots to the merchandise, guiding them across an electronic checkerboard with barcodes embedded in the floor panels. Once the robot arrives at its destination, it picks up an entire shelf of merchandise and delivers it to the packing station. It then speeds off to its next assignment. They know if they need to get from point A to point B and they're not carrying anything, they can go underneath the grid we call that tunneling, so they're very smart. You'd think they'd run into each other. Yeah, you'd think that, but it never happens. If you had to replace the robots with people, how many people would you have to hire? Probably one and a half people for every robot. So it saves you a lot of money? Yes. And it's not just going on in warehouses. El Camino Hospital in California's Silicon Valley has a fleet of robots called tugs that ferry meals to patients, 
medicines to doctors and nurses, blood samples to the lab, and dirty linen to the laundry. A hospital spokesman told us the tugs are supposed to supplement nurses and hospital staff, not replace them. But he also believes that robots and humans working together is the beginning of a new era. Robots are now wielding scalpels for surgeons, assisting in the most delicate operations, allowing them to see and snip their way through prostate surgeries with minimal damage. And they've begun filling prescriptions in hospital dispensaries and local pharmacies. Economic evolution has been going on for centuries, and society has always successfully adapted to technological change, creating more jobs in the process. But Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee of MIT think this time may be different. Technology is always creating jobs, it's always destroying jobs, but right now the pace is accelerating. It's faster, we think, than ever before in history. So as a consequence, we are not creating jobs at the same pace that we need to. And we ain't seen nothing yet. The changes are coming so quickly, it's been difficult for workers to retrain themselves and for entrepreneurs to figure out where the next opportunities may be. The catalyst is something called computer learning, or artificial intelligence. The ability to feed massive amounts of data into supercomputers and program them to teach themselves and improve their performance. What's the weather like today? It's how Apple was able to create Siri, the iPhone robot. Here's the weather for today. And Google, its self-driving car. We've been amazed at how rapidly this has been happening. This is Jeopardy! IBM's deep QA system that plays Jeopardy. We had a contest here. They played against our best MIT students, the best Harvard students we could put it up against. And uh, not surprisingly, Watson won. And it's being used in real practical applications now on Wall Street and in, in call centers. Um, Siri, millions of people are using that every day. The fact that computers can now understand and respond to human speech, the fact that they can actually generate prose of decent quality, they can drive cars, they can win at Jeopardy. We're seeing technology demonstrate skills that it's never, ever done before. And it's putting new categories of jobs in the sights of automation. The 60 percent of the workforce that makes its living gathering and analyzing information. This piece of software, called eDiscovery, is now used by law firms in the discovery portion of legal proceedings, a job that used to require hundreds of people sifting through boxes and boxes of documents. We now have robots gathering intelligence and fighting wars, and robot computers trading stocks on Wall Street. It's all part of a massive high-tech industry that's contributed enormous productivity and wealth to the American economy, but surprisingly little in the way of employment. We absolutely are creating new jobs, new companies, and entirely new industries these days. When, when Eric and I go out to Silicon Valley and look around, the, the scale and the pace of creation is astonishing. What these companies are not doing, though, is hiring a ton of people to help them with their work. Because they don't have them? Because they can't find them? Because, because they, 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 they don't can't, need them? They can't find everyone they need, but they don't need that many people to work in these incredibly large and influential companies. Uh, to make that concrete, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google are now all public companies. Combined, they have something close to a trillion dollars in market capitalization. Together, the four of them employ fewer than 150,000 people, and that's less than the number of new entrants into the American workforce every month. And it's roughly half the number of people that work for General Electric. Ironically, one of the few bright spots is a modest rise in U.S. manufacturing an early casualty of automation that is making a comeback because of it. This Tesla factory in California turns out battery-powered cars using state-of-the-art robots that can change tools and perform a multitude of different tasks, negating some of the advantages of moving jobs offshore. Annual investment by U.S. manufacturers in new technology has increased almost 30 percent since the recession ended and research institutions and robotics companies funded by venture capital are constantly searching for innovations like the Roomba vacuum cleaner. Traditional robots inside factories. That was the brainchild of Rodney Brooks, a pioneer who ran the artificial intelligence lab at MIT before launching iRobot, one of the most successful robotics companies in the U.S. This is his latest progeny, a friendly, affordable chap named Baxter. It's meant to be able to go in a factory where they don't have robots at the moment. 
and ordinary workers can train it to do simple tasks. Mm -hmm. Such as? Well, a, a simple one is uh, just, uh, uh, for instance, picking stuff off a, off a conveyor belt. So it's going to go down and, and uh, find, it, find the object and grab it and bring it over and put it to another, another spot. Baxter costs $22,000 and can be trained to do a new task by a co-worker in a matter of minutes. It can also be upgraded like an iPad with new software as new applications are developed. And when you're training it... Brooks and investors in his new startup, Rethink Robotics, see a potential market worth tens of billions of dollars and believe that Baxter could help small U.S. manufacturers level the playing field against low-cost foreign competitors. If you're using robots to compete with the, the simple tasks that a low-paid worker does in a foreign country, you can bring it back here and do that task here. Baxter costs 22 grand. Yep. How long does he last? Well, it's three years. Three years. So you can, you can think of that as 6,500 hours. I think it works out to about $3.40 an hour. About that, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. $3.40, so that's probably the wages of a Chinese it's worker, just right? Just about right there now. So here, you could, in, you could buy one of these robots. It would be like any Chinese worker. In, in a manner of speaking. <laughs> That strategy has already had some success at Adept Technology, the largest manufacturer of industrial robots in the country with a wide and varied product line. John Dolcinus is the CEO. So this is our flagship product. This is uh, our Cobra robot. This is the class of robot that was used to automate uh, Philips electric shavers. The robots at the Dutch company's factory in the Netherlands proved to be so efficient and economical the Philips decided to move its main shaver assembly line out of China and back to Holland. I think that those workers in China, in India, are more in the bullseye Excellent. of this automation tidal wave that we're talking about than the American workers. But even if offshore manufacturing returns to the U.S., most of the jobs will go to robots. When I see what computers and robots can do right now, I project that forward for two, three more generations. I think we're gonna find ourselves in a world where the work as we currently think about it is largely done by machines. And what are the people gonna do? That's the $64,000 question. Science fiction is actually my best guide because I think we are in that time frame gonna be in a very weird, very different place. It brings to mind Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey and the rebellious computer robot HAL. Technologically speaking, we are just about there. Open the pod bay doors, HAL. I'm sorry, Dave. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Everyone agrees that it's impossible now to short-circuit technology. It has a life of its own, and the world is all in for better or for worse. Stop, Dave. We wanted to leave you on this positive note. One thing that Andy and I agree on is that we're not super worried about robots becoming uh, self-aware and, and challenging our authority. That part of science fiction, I think, is not very likely to happen. <laughs>